We focus on the design, development, and deployment of cutting edge technology for information security and privacy, all the while uh, attending to the social and economic aspects of new technologies in society and their implications for security and privacy. So uh, Professor Jonathan Zittrain is a perfect speaker uh, fitting with those themes. He is professor of law at Harvard Law School, uh, where he co-founded its Berkman Center for Internet and Society, which is one of the first uh, centers, I think, in higher education really looking at the impact, the new social and broader impact of new technologies in the internet uh, in society. Uh, prof uh, professor Zittrain was formerly professor of internet governance and regulation at Oxford University before going to Harvard. Um, he is part of the Open Net Initiative. And he, uh, many of you might be familiar with his book, which I brought to show you, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. And today he's going to talk to us about that and other ideas. So uh, join me in welcoming Professor Zittrain to Dartmouth. Thanks, Denise. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to uh, be here today. Sound level OK? Good. Uh, thanks for coming out to hear what I've got to say. I've uh, got a few visual aids uh, to share. Um, Vince Cerf says that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Um, so uh, I would be perfectly honored if you wanted to interrupt me as I was talking. I'm confident we can get things back on track if need be. But uh, please, just shout out. We're a small enough room that we uh, don't have to stand on ceremony. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about civic technologies. Civic technologies is a term I've coined, um, so I don't expect uh, anyone to really know what it means just yet. But when I utter it, I think of technologies that rise or fall depending on the nature and quality and amount of participation that they get from their users. This is not most technologies. Your refrigerator will not chill your food any colder if you're enthusiastic about what it does. It won't work any better if your neighbors are really into refrigeration. And this is true of many technologies. They're not civic. They're good, they're just not civic. There are a couple technologies that are civic, and that civic character gives them an unexpected extra boost when they are new that very few people tend to foresee. And then once they get really successful, they tend to hit a certain patch of problems. They have special vulnerabilities that are exclusive to the fact that they are civic that have to be overcome. And if they're not overcome, bad things happen. So I wanted to organize uh, this talk around some examples of civic technologies to give you a flavor of what I'm talking about and to try to express why I think almost anybody in a room like this has a role to play in trying to keep vital some of the civic technologies that have come to be at the center of our information technology environment. So um, the internet is one such technology. These are three of the founders of the internet, classmates together at the same high school in suburban Los Angeles in the 60s. We had a French club or a debate club. They have a let's build a global network club that worked out very well. And um, they're pictured here for their 25th anniversary retrospective in Newsweek magazine a picture that took hours to composite and for which there's a lot we can draw out of it. Uh, for one thing, um, yes, the internet was built by white males, usually bearded. What are you going to do? Second, um, there's a certain playfulness at its core that you don't find within many other technologies. You find it sometimes throughout science and technology, the so-called, in England they call them boffins, scientists who are sort of the absent-minded type. They might have a propeller on their hat, but you know, a little bit Fred McMurray from that old movie, some of you may remember. And there's a lot of that in internet culture that is not present in some of the other technologies that might have and did compete with the internet for dominance. They're very playful people. Um, they're showing here that you can build a network out of just about anything, including tin cans and vegetables. Oddly, their network doesn't work. It goes from John's ear to Steve's ear, and then Steve's ear to Vince's ear, and then mouth to mouth, um, which I'm hoping is an inside joke, rather than the framers of the internet don't know how to string tin cans together. Um, and 
In here, you see the original map of the internet as it was first founded. And this offers us some lessons, too. It shows us that there was one huge constraint and one huge freedom that they had when they were building this thing. The constraint was that they did not have a lot of money. This was not the standard kind of Fred Smith has an idea for Federal Express and then gets enough money to pay for planes, depots, a hub of Memphis, and delivery people. And then voila, we can move a package from somewhere to somewhere overnight. The fact that they didn't have a lot of money to start with greatly influenced the technical protocols that they generated so that, for example, if you're MIT and you want to get onto this internet, you just get to somebody nearby, in this case BBN, and BBN will pass your data along because it's the neighborly thing to do. This does not signify any particular contractual relationship between MIT and BBN in the initial configuration. It's just a nice thing to do. And it's aided by the freedom they had, which corresponds to the limitation of not having a lot of money to start off with. The freedom was they didn't have to make any money. These guys had no business plan for the internet. They were not expecting to make any money from it. And by and large, they didn't. Some of them got some research grants, uh, but kind of small potatoes sort of stuff. And that is deeply, deeply reflected in the internet's protocols. So for example, as data is flowing along this line back and forth, it's not particularly easy to know who at BBN or MIT initiated it. Because who cares? It's just data. Get it to where it's going. Whereas when you think of some of the proprietary counterparts that actually didn't even notice the internet for years, that thought they were going to be a global network. We were going to get a global network. Make no mistake. That was about as inevitable as the invention of the wheel or the Cadbury marshmallow egg. There are some ideas that just are unavoidable. They will happen. In this case, though, CompuServe or AOL or Prodigy or the source or MCI mail or any of the other number of proprietary services, the very first prompt you would see when logging in was username or user ID. You had to be assigned one so that you could be charged by the minute for your connect time. And if you engaged in premium services or something, they could charge you for that too. The internet has none of this mechanism. When they devised email for the internet, you would think the first thing you would do is exactly what CompuServe and AOL and the others did for their versions of electronic mail, which was you need a database of users who authenticate themselves, and then they can send mail as that user, right? It's just obvious. They instead, being lazy, laziness being one of the most important features of a good computer scientist, um, they said, we already have a database. It's a distributed database because everyone knows his or her name. So why would we bother to replicate that in some centralized database? Let's just each remember our email address. And then you can just walk up to any piece of software and declare that to be your address and away you go. What's the only drawback to that? That I suppose someone could put in an email address that wasn't theirs. Who would ever do that? And in fact, within internet protocol, not just in email address assignment and usage, but down to the very fabric of internet protocol and how each bit moves along, there is a lot of faith and trust and neighborliness, the hallmarks of a civic technology that either will or won't work depending on just how neighborly and trustworthy the users are. So these three guys get together and more join. And eventually, they've got enough that they get a little more formal. They declare themselves to be the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. This is the homepage for the IETF. I wouldn't blame you if you thought it looked a little 1994, sort of a badge of honor that there's no flash on the IETF homepage. It sort of says, just keep on walking, nothing to see here. And the IETF gets together, and they work on internet protocols. They resolve the questions in email of like, should it be to and then from, or from and then to? Like, which side you drive on the road? Like, it doesn't matter that much, but you need to be consistent. And they're the ones that help nail that down. They don't have any formal incorporation. They're just a group, a confederation. In fact, their motto is, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. And in a room like this, where they're discussing something like to versus from or from versus to, they'll actually call for a hum because they hate votes so much. And you can tell if the room hums as to whether or not there's rough consensus on a certain issue. You call for a hum, everybody goes, hmm, yeah, yeah, OK, I get it. On to the next issue. 
it requires a lot of trust. Yes, sir. Uh, would you say also that uh, this sort of a rough consensus thing goes well with not having to specify too much before getting the protocol to work? For example, uh, the uh, circuits which the competitors uh, designed for their circuit base yes. uh, carried around lots of bytes on accounting. Every byte uh, presumes some agreement as to how to handle yes. it. And that means that you have to keep agreeing on things in a large group of people continuously. Yes. So uh, that's a huge cost. Yes. This seems to be the way to cut that cost. That's true, I think. And it doesn't always mean there will be less specification. There might be something highly specified, but it will be contrary to the instincts of the IETF people to think of enforcement mechanisms for it. I mean, even within an MP3 file, there's actually a field, there's a copyright bit in an MP3 file. It's like, is this copyrighted? And you can check the box, like, yep, sure is copyrighted, now let's copy it. And in a way, here the IETF, they have some specifications for so-called quality of service, trying to get data at a certain rate through the cloud, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But all of that is the data should just flag itself if it's in a hurry. Kind of like within email, there's a way to like check a little red box, you know, up its priority, which you know means people will pay less attention to it because it's an honor system. It's not like you only get five urgent emails a day and once you've done the fifth, you can't do a sixth. So there's a certain drawback to a scheme that's all aspiration and no enforcement. But you're right that it makes it very easy then. You don't end up with all of this uh, elaborated protocol to do enforcement, you can just express preference or desire. So. Uh, is there any idea of just about how much cost and effort this approach has uh, saved? I don't know how you'd go about quantifying it. For my purposes, I simply say that it turns out that when you start off with a phenomenon that does not obsess with how finely to cut the pie to split it, but worries more about the overall size of the pie and says we'll cut it up later, that that can tend in its early stages to outclass those schemes that are really obsessed with the pie slice size. And that therefore it does better, even though it might start out much more obscure. And that's in short the story of how the internet, in my view, ended up transcending CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy. There were these key moments when AOL is kind of like they built a land bridge over to the internet. I don't know, was anybody ever an AOL user? And it started where you just logged in and all you could do is communicate with other AOL users. And then one day, there was a gateway and your mail could get from AOL to the internet. It's, yes, yes. It's reminiscent to me of um, a cruise ship for the first time pulling up outside a, uh, an unspoiled Caribbean island and the gangplank goes down and the people on the island are kind of looking and people in Bermuda shorts step off and like, where can I buy tchotchkes? And it's like, well, uh, there's a plus to that, but there's also a minus. And a number of people on the internet, to this day, if somebody says, you know, here's my email address and it's an AOL address, it's like your cred goes, right, exactly. <laughs> Memo, like, use you can use. If you have an AOL address, get a new one. So um, if you want to join the ITF, this is what you see. It's not a membership organization, no cards, no dues, no secret handshakes, smiley face. It's a large open international community of network designers. Smiley face. Can you imagine any other formalized standards body that would have this on its membership page? It's a very strange thing, but of course, they are trying to attract the kind of people who would find this attractive, and they are trying to repel the kind of people who would not or who aren't techy enough to like it. And in fact, that's what Dave Clark uh, who's down the street from me at MIT says about the early days of the internet and as it got more formal, he says, we've changed our name four times. It's a deliberate strategy. If you want to make sure people don't find you, you can change your name every two years. So we used to call it the Interna Internet Configuration Control Board. We made that term up to make it sound as uninteresting and boring as possible so we could go meet in private without anybody noticing us. Then we called it the Internet Advisory Board, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not like they're trying to fly a flag and say everybody needs to join the IETF because the internet is your future. It's more like, I don't know, the Vulcans waiting to see who discovers warp drive. And when they see the signature, then they arrive. They're like, congratulations, welcome to the Federation. But you kind of have to earn it sort of thing. I figured that was topical, Star Trek, you know, this week kind of thing. 
So um, compare that not just to CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy, and the other commercial services that many of us through the mid-1990s thought were going to be the future of global networking, but compare it to, say, the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, founded over 100 years ago to deal with the problem of the use of encryption and telegraph wires um, with an icon that kind of rivals uh, that of NASA in sort of uh, datedness. And uh, they're a very formal group. They're now under the auspices of the UN. Membership requirements for the ITU, you must be a state. <laughs> You must be a country to join the ITU. And they get together and through their plenipotentiary conferences and World Telecommunications Standardization Assemblies and their secretariat, they answer such questions as, what should the international dialing prefixes for telephones be? So it's the ITU that, in its democratic way, decides that the United States will have one and Ecuador will have five, nine, three, and that Motorola will be a country. Motorola is a country for these purposes because of the Iridium system and uh, how that all worked. So the ITU is of the belief that the current internet is a total mess. They don't understand how it even came about and that the ITU should be spearheading the charge for a new one. And there are people in the US government who believe this as well. They've actually started a project called the Focus Group on Next Generation Networks, also known as the Fagidigan. And the Fidiginigan has been meeting. This is their ninth one at Gatwick. And there's all sorts of documents. And you need to have a TIES account in order to see the documents. And they've been talking about this new next generation network. They've actually come up with a schematic for it. Here's the schematic. Yeah, they've got a uh, media resource control function and a media resource processing function, a traffic measurement function. And you realize that what this gives you that the internet doesn't is for one thing, the internet assumes that the point of putting a piece of data in at one end is for it to come out the other. <laughs> it's just about getting it there. This assumes that some data doesn't want to be moved. And you can't trust the person putting it in to say that it should get to the other side. So you need an entire amount of apparatus, not just to do the traffic measurement that I was talking about for Prodigy and CompuServe before, but also just to know if the data says, don't copy me, that at any given point along this chain, it won't copy the data. It turns out that requires a lot of boxes and arrows to make it work. What I especially like here is there's a little brown box here called internet. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, there'll still be an internet. It'll plug in over here to the right. Um, so how does internet packet transport work? Well, <laughs> I've likened it to a mosh pit. Um, and there's some strength to that analogy. If I wanted to get this semi-functional clicker to the back of the room, the traditional network way, it would be like FedEx. We would deputize somebody. Denise, as the convener of this assembly, would take it and make sure it got somewhere. And if it disappeared on the way, we would know exactly whom to blame. That's the FedEx way to do it. It's totally sane and rational. It's how you get the US mail from one place to another. But that means you need an entire mail system, which they couldn't afford. So instead, what they do is they make it like a bucket brigade. I say, say, would you mind? Uh, I'm trying to get this to the back of the room. And I hand it to you, and you hand it to her, even though you don't really know each other. And she hands it to him, and he hands it to him. And it eventually gets to where it's going, just like passing a big sloshy jug of beer at a sporting event. right? And like you put your pants at risk for somebody you don't know down there from someone that you haven't met. And you don't even like get to extract some beer off the top for your labors. It's just a neighborly thing you do. The social pressure, can you imagine being like, no, no, I'm fine. Like, no, no, it's for the person over there. You're like, no, no, really, I'm not going to move this beer. What would happen next? It would not be pretty. It's unthinkable, actually, not to pass a beer along at a sporting event. And similarly, that's the way packet movement is supposed to take place on the internet. That's why we call it. Uh, in the trades, uh, best efforts routing. We don't know that it'll get there, but we'll make best efforts. It's also called uh, send it and pray, or every packet an adventure. And that can make you wonder whether this is a rational way to build a network. It might work in small experimental circles, which is exactly where it started. But why would you think this could scale to be really big? And it's not clear it can scale to be really big. There are many internet engineers who are like, yeah, the experiment is still going on. I'm really curious to see how it turns out. IBM, as late as 1992, was known to say, you couldn't possibly build a corporate network using internet protocol. It was just too weird. It was too dicey. You need our proprietary IBM solution. 
That's why the framers of the internet, sorry? That was because they were promoting public domain, which also is a special effort in that network. Yes. It doesn't have all the internal contacts, it's just different. Yes. Is this a different level of technology? Oh, I took IBM's critique to be a deeper one. It wasn't just their flavor of crazy network doesn't work, but our flavor of crazy network does. But I could be wrong. I thought it was also that good token ring. Yes, good old token ring. Those were the days. Good times. So um, the uh, framers of the internet sometimes say their mascot would be the bumblebee because of these doubts, whether small or large. Because it's said, apocryphally, that the fur to wingspan ratio of the bumblebee is far too large for it to be able to fly. And yet, somehow, the bee flies. Turns out, thanks to um, massive government funding, in 2006, we finally figured out how bees fly. Um, they flap their wings very quickly. <laughs> so. so all right, you get a network that is really successful, that doesn't have a lot of measurement, that does this kind of best effort stuff, and it gets more and more popular, and some land bridges are built to it, and eventually, it starts to subsume the other more rational networks that many of us, again, thought were going to be all the rage. It then hits that plateau that I alluded to, where a civic technology that relies on goodwill is, at some point, worth subverting. Or there are so many people using it that just sheer nervousness makes things not work anymore. I actually remember an experiment that Douglas Hofstadter ran once in Scientific American after he inherited uh, Martin Gardner's game, uh, uh, mathematical games column there. He was interested in something he called the principle of reverberating doubt. And he had some kind of game theory hypothetical where it was like, there's a button in front of each person in this room. And at the count of three, you can either press the button or not. And if at the count of three, no one presses the button, everybody gets $1,000. If, on the other hand, at the count of three, anybody presses the button, those who press the button get $100, and those who did not press get nothing. What should you do? Now, this is not a real trade-off kind of thing. It's like, it's obvious. Don't press the button. Everybody gets $1,000. Everybody gets a car. What's the problem? But it turns out that the more and more people there are in the room, the more you're just like, some loser is going to press the button, right? <laughs> I better press the button defensively. And sure enough, so long as more than one person presses the button, they were right. And they can say, wait, you are the loser. You're like, no, no, that's the loser. I'm the one who was smart enough to know that I should press the button because of that loser. Shame on you, loser, right? And that eventually things get big enough, everybody's pressing the button all the time. So for those reasons and others, the internet starts to get to this phase. And a great example of this was documented uh, just over a year ago when the state of Pakistan asked that YouTube be blocked for people in Pakistan. This is not that uh, surprising a thing to have happen. Wearing another hat, I'm part of something called the Open Net Initiative that tracks internet filtering around the world. And we've just put out a book called Access Denied that tracks filtering in about 40 states around the world, routinely using technical means to try to prevent people in the state from getting to certain websites or URLs. OK, so Pakistan asks all of its ISPs to implement blocking for YouTube because there's something on YouTube that they don't like. One of the ISPs chooses to use a parlor trick in internet routing to affect the block. And here's how it works. This is where the mosh pit metaphor breaks down. In a mosh pit, there's no addressing. You can't be introduced to the pit and say, like, I'm trying to go over there to the like, hot dog stand. Like, OK, right? You just move around wherever they're going to take you. And I guess there's some. Uh, some people may know this better than I. I guess there's some agreement that eventually you end up back at the front where you started. I, I don't know. It's a mosh pit. Well, on the internet, you do need to know which direction to pass the laser pointer when I give it to you that moves it closer to the destination. Otherwise, it just moves around randomly and hopes to find something. So in order to do that, you need a map. Well, there's no centralized map for the internet. They don't like centralization, these computer scientists. Instead, there's basically a decentralized map created when every person or entity that's capable of routing looks exactly one person radius around. So I look to my left and I see somebody, and the person on my right can't see that far. But I turn to my right and I say, here's who I see on my left. 
and now they know who's two clicks away, and they can turn to their right and say, here's what I know about what's two clicks away from me because of what the person to the left of me said. Lather, rinse, repeat. Now you have as big a map as you need adjusted dynamically as data moves around. So OK, this ISP in Pakistan chooses to effectuate the block by announcing through that gossip net that to its own surprise, it has just discovered that it is YouTube. That it is standing right on top of YouTube there in Pakistan. Who knew? And what that meant was that subscribers' packets would go to it, and they would throw them away. And they would go no further, because they're throwing them away because the whole point is to block YouTube. But they announced this not just to their subscribers, but one click out. It's a root advertisement, which means that ISPs near it start sending that ISP packets otherwise bound for YouTube which get thrown away. Lather, rinse, repeat. And within the course of approximately 20 minutes, YouTube is blocked everywhere in the world. If you're sitting in Hanover, New Hampshire, and trying to get your packets over so you can watch like chocolate rain, your packets are going to Pakistan, and they're not coming back. Now that's weird. That's weird, right? There was absolutely nothing that one of the most popular websites in the world, run by the most powerful company in the world, could do about this situation. YouTube and Google were not privileged in any way to deal with this hijacking. So all right, what happened next? How is it that within a little period of time, it fixed itself and it got going again? Well, it's almost like the bat signal went up, and who answers the call but NANOG, the North American Network Operators Group. Nanog is not incorporated. They have no president. None of them gets paid. Nanog is a group of people self-identified as people on Nanog who, on a nice sunny day, stay inside and reply to messages on a message board that is about networks. That's what makes you Nanog. So some of these Nanog people actually work at internet service providers as mid-level employees. And they're just like, oh, we've got a live one here. This is a case of IP hijacking. It's not YouTube engineers doing something stupid, et cetera. This is a real one. What are we going to do? And they start exchanging ideas. They came up with some code. This is how you would reprogram your routers if you happen to be near one in order to ignore this one spurious datum. And within a while, the fix gets propagated, and it goes through. Now, if you're YouTube, are you happy or sad with this story? I could see you being sad because your entire business could go down at any moment when any ISP chooses to utter one lie about you. And within 20 minutes, that's it, you're down. That seems bad. That's like a vulnerability that some center for security, technology, and society should study. On the other hand, it's like, wait a minute. What you're telling me is that if my house catches fire, the bad news is there's no fire department. The good news is that people, like neighbors, will turn up with hoses and put it out and like, help me put my furniture back in order. And then they'll be like, no, you don't pay us. It's just what we do. <laughs> so this is an example of a civic technology that hits that first bump, that supersonic barrier as it gets really popular, and that in response to the newfound vulnerabilities within that bump, evolves a civic defense system, the thin, geeky line that stands between us and chaos, that no one pays and no one knows. They're just there laboring because it's something they do. If I wanted to make an attack on internet infrastructure, this Friday, I think, would be a particularly good time. Anybody want to hypothesize why? Yes. She's like, they're going to a meeting, which is partially true. The full answer is from the back row, which is the Star Trek premiere. Right? That no one will be minding the store. It's not like they have ships or something. If they all go to a Star Trek movie at the same time, the internet is defenseless. <laughs> That's weird, right? Now, like, some of them are into Battlestar Galactica, so, like, whew. But it's still a highly informal way to keep critical infrastructure going. Now, my claim in the book is broader even than this. It's saying this isn't just a story about the internet. This is a story about a class of technologies we call civic technologies that edge out the others because they're so flexible and don't have huge amounts of measurement and worry built in, but then hit this vulnerability. Wikipedia is another excellent example of this. 
If a man named Jimbo came up to you in 2001, it's like, I got a great idea. We start with seven articles. Then anyone can edit anything at any time. And we'll get a free encyclopedia for the world. huh? Right. Dumbest idea ever. Not just a bee. That's a piece of felt. I mean, that is just so profoundly stupid to expect that anything good would come of it that not even Jimbo had this idea. Jimbo's idea was for Newpedia, which was going to be an encyclopedia written by experts that Jimbo would pay money to in the hopes that they would write articles. I pay the experts money, they write articles. I have less money, but that's OK. I'm Jimbo, I have lots. And we have Newpedia. That didn't work. It turns out that actually giving people a lot of money to think big thoughts and parking them in an office, we call it tenure around here, doesn't always result in the most productive people in the world. So um, somebody came up with the idea of having this wiki in the back end to at least let people make suggestions and concrete edits to the articles for the experts to consider before piping it through into Newpedia. That's the genesis of Wikipedia. That back room became the front room. And that's what we have today, an idea that no one had with an aim that turned out to be larger than anybody expected. Now 2.4 million articles, uh, even more now, in English Wikipedia. And uh, I think there's over 2,000 in Klingon Wikipedia. I haven't looked at it recently. Um, and uh, over 100,000 in Volapük, which is the new Esperanto. Who knew? It's like, what's wrong with the old Esperanto? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there's um, a new Esperanto called Volapük. And somebody who's really into Volapük wrote a parser that translates from simplified English Wikipedia. That's a separate one from the English one. There's one called simplified English. You can uh, translate from simplified English into Volapük. And vroom, overnight, there's 100,000 articles in Volapük. And the Esperanto people were rip shit. Uh, I, sorry, they were just like, oh my god, like this is cheating. You can't give them the above the fold 100,000 like elite status because they cheated and it was a big to-do and Volapük wins. So, um, okay, how does Wikipedia, which starts in a backwater, people are kind of editing it, at some point Slashdot gets alerted and to everyone's shock, Slashdot, instead of deciding it was lame, thinks it's cool and starts helping. And so like articles about Zelda go way up and they contribute their part of things. Um, but it turns out Wikipedia hits a bump because it starts becoming the first hit on Google for like proper or improper nouns. You just type a word and like Wikipedia is the first hit. So suddenly it matters to people. Now, just as it would be good for a spammer to hit you with email that advertises something, which is why they say over 90% of all email is spam at this point. Why shouldn't spammers be changing every single page of the ultimately editable Wikipedia into an ad for a Rolex watch? And the answer is they are trying. What holds them back? Administrators of Wikipedia, aka users of Wikipedia, who meet, this is their nanog, the administrator's notice board where incidents are reported. The notice board is itself a page you can edit. Here's a current snapshot of the page. It's a big list of problems. And, you know, number one, tendentious editing by user Andy V. Phil. User the transhumanist, a non attacking me for reverting, my favorite, a long story. <laughs> so it turns out you just bring your problem to this page, and there are people around the world hitting reload looking for problems to solve. Why? I don't know. Are there any Wikipedians here? No? Ah, you're one of those shy Wikipedians. What's your zone on Wikipedia? What do you do? <laughs> All right, we will let you if you want. Not tell. <laughs> you what? I'd, I'd rather not tell. You would rather, just like Batman, it's as if somebody's like, are there any superheroes in the room? <laughs> And somebody turns to Clark Kent or to Batman's alter ego, whose name is Bruce Wayne, and is like, oh, Bruce, that's you. And Bruce is like, ixnay on the Atman Bay, right? You're like, look, no, really, I have the EFF t-shirt, but I'm, I'm just, you know. So fair enough. Wikipedians aren't in it for the glory and for the like, oh, man, you know, let's all give a round of applause. But there are people who will go to this page and fix problems as they come up 
just because it's what they want to do. Nobody's paying them to do it. And you end up, thanks to them, with a Wikipedia that isn't a bunch of ads for a Rolex watch. If they were all to just somehow be totally taken by a mind puzzle or a, you know, you name it, move on to something else, they like, decide they like Twitter, Wikipedia would be dead within about 45 minutes. At all times, Wikipedia is 45 minutes away from utter destruction. Talk about, as they say um, in legal circles sometimes, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. It's not like you just turn the key on Wikipedia and then it runs. It only continues working because there are several thousand people committed to keeping it going at all times. OK, so let's now turn to another technology that is a civic technology, but that lacks a civic defense system. And that's the personal computer. This is a 21-year-old Steve Jobs introducing the Apple II personal computer at the West Coast Computer Fair in 1977. This fair was described as 10,000 walking, talking computer freaks. And that was his target audience. For the first time ever in a single plastic molded case, you could get a box that if you take it home and hook it up to your television set, your television set, you would get a blinking cursor. And it would just sit there. This was useless out of the box. That's kind of weird, right? A technology that doesn't do anything out of the box. Just like the internet didn't do anything out of the box. You had to figure out somebody you wanted to communicate with. Unlike CompuServe. CompuServe was like, we know you're lonely. <laughs> right? Just pay us money and we'll, we'll entertain you. The internet will not entertain you. Only things on the other end of it that you connect with will entertain you. And similarly here, this box will not entertain you. You have to come up with something to do. So some people would be like, 10, print high. 20, go to 10. And hilarity ensues. If you've never done this, highly recommended to do your own hello world. But it turns out that it's not just limited to what you can make it do. So long as there's somebody out there that can do something cool with the programming, they can give it to you, share it with you, or sell it to you. And Steve Jobs is just like, yeah, I assume that's what's going to happen. We'll see. Technology that rises or falls depending on the kind and nature of participation from its users. So within two years of the introduction of the Apple II, 1979, Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston invent VisiCalc, the first digital spreadsheet ever. And businesses around the world are like Z-O-M-G. <laughs> this personal computer intended for hobbyists, the kind of people that like Heath kits, you know, build my clock rather than buy one because that's cool. Suddenly, businesses needed apples because apples ran VisiCalc. Apples are flying off the shelves, and Steve Jobs has no idea why. He had to commission market research to figure out what had made the box so popular. That's an example of a technology very much divorced from its vendor once it leaves the factory, and it's totally consonant with the vendor's business plan. That idea of being able to put on people's desks, including non-nerds, a powerful processor to give them an environment where they can run any code they can either imagine or acquire from someone else. That is the heart of the personal computer. That's the medium in which we swim that is so ubiquitous we don't even think about it. But just like the internet didn't have to be our only network, this did not have to be our only form of IT as we are now starting to see today. But this instrumentality from 1977 through, I don't know, would you say, what year is this thing? Anybody among the nerds here? What year would you say this box is? 92. 92. What makes you say 92? Uh, ah, yes, the Telltale 66 light with the button next to it. What happens if you press the button next to the 66? You close it down? Slows it down. I see. It goes in and out of turbo mode. Leading to the question, why would you ever want it to run slower? Right. Games, because Prince of Persia might run twice as fast, and that's annoying. Too fast. Yes, too fast. So you need legacy mode. And um, that's actually, uh, my hypothesis has been the, the, the hamsters running on wheels inside got too tired, and sometimes you had to slow it down. But your, your explanation is actually more persuasive. Um, it does turn out they've just invented a hamster-powered paper shredder. 
Um, so the hamster goes in here, and you put the paper up here, and he runs on the wheel, and it shreds the paper, and then he can live in the paper afterwards. So it just shows, uh, yeah, reuse is a viable alternative to recycling. So all right, from 77 to 92 up through 2007, you have this fact about the machines, which is you get the machine, you hand it code, it runs the code, no questions asked. And that means that in present day, you end up with machines, whether they are Windows or Apple or you name it, GNU Linux, they're running huge piles of code. And we have absolutely no idea what any of it does. I defy our friend over here to tell us exactly what smss.exe here is doing with only 400k. Anything? Right. I wouldn't blame you. Who knows? Right. It's, he's like, it's Windows. I don't do Windows. Oh, yeah? How about ATS server, my friend? Because then, how do we even know if it's ATS server? It might be, just be something that says it's ATS server. We got nothing here. And that means that we are making a leap of faith at least as big as the internet engineers who assumed that if you throw data out into the internet cloud, it would somehow work its way to the other end on unicorns and buttercups. We're making the same assumption here, which turns out, of course, to no longer be such a great assumption. The PC has long since hit its supersonic bump moment where it's been worth subverting. And you see news stories like this. You take your Windows machine out of the box, you plug it into the wall, ready to go and update it to the latest patches, you have four minutes. Because if you don't do it fast enough, enough other computers are hijacked out there and randomly knocking on internet protocol address doors that they will knock on your computer's door and infect it before you have finished patching it. That's weird. Uh, this is the part of the platform that's under control of the manufacturer. Uh, which sticks to a very different management model. Now we can get into a religious war, if you'd like, <laughs> as to just how much Bill Gates is to blame for this situation versus others. Ah. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that um, the um, community model of uh, development yes. that you are describing yes. is not how uh, an operating system like Windows is created and managed. More, uh, I mean, Windows is managed specifically for profit with uh, uh, a lot of uh, communication between the groups yes. that are driven by marketing. But let's at least make my claims clear. Claim number one is that for my purposes, often Windows, an admittedly proprietary system, is nearly as civic as GNU Linux, which I realize is a controversial claim. But that's the claim I make because both of them are Turing machines that allow you to select what code to run without interference from the vendor, even though one says you can't reprogram it under the hood. I, I realize yes. there, is actually, there are actually two issues here. Yes. The issue that, the issue that you're pointing out, that it's a general purpose computer, yes. is very true. So Windows got its rise. Correct. when people contribute in software to each other. Correct. However, this particular issue, yes. ownage within minutes, yes. is, uh, uh, I mean, is, is just uh, the... Which you don't think is true with, say, GNU Linux. Uh, no. In which case, you are blaming Bill Gates. <laughs> so, uh, 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 <laughs> Uh, I, I don't am know. Certainly, I'm certainly blaming. I'm certainly blaming Microsoft corporate culture yes, for throwing yes. the kitchen sink. By Bill Gates, I meant Microsoft. Uh, they threw in essentially. They threw in every technology that could possibly be down yes. the line used to sell the eyes of the users to now advertisers. Now, at this point, that I'm with you that there is enough spilled milk everywhere that we can point to lots of cracks in the jug. Just like at the point of the principle of reverberating doubt, there's four people that press the button. It's like, which was the one to really blame? I agree with you that there's plenty of issues with Microsoft, which Microsoft has fessed up to as well. But if you are going to have a general purpose computer that allows its user to arbitrarily decide what code to run, then it turns out that this vulnerability, where the user isn't even asked, it's just the computer gets compromised because of a flaw, that is but one flavor of vulnerability, which includes people who click on the dancing hamster because they saw the hamster dance. And when you do, the computer's like, I don't know about this, Davey. You're like, no, no, Goliath, it's fine. 
and you go ahead and run it, and boom, you're pwned. And that is true on any platform you want to come up with that's general purpose. Yes. OK. So we get flavors of worms and viruses that propagate sometimes through passive backdoors that are unambiguously operating system flaws, sometimes through front doors where we say, we want to run it. We want the Jessica Simpson screensaver. It gives us pictures of Jessica Simpson. It also happens to be spyware. And some people are like, pictures of Jessica Simpson, <laughs> spyware, pictures of Jessica Simpson. And others just don't know. But that leads to a level of sophistication among the malware that is truly extraordinary. I mean, the stormworm is one of these amazing things, striking back against researchers that seek to destroy it, shutting down their access for days. As you try to investigate, it knows and it punishes. They're afraid. I've never seen this before. <laughs> and you're like, is this a script to 24, or is it network world? I mean, come on. This is weird. And our defenses against it have not evolved significantly since 1977. This is an email sent a long time ago to Harvard Law School faculty and staff warning of an insurgence of fraudulent emails at the law school and giving a huge pile of advice about what you're supposed to do. Because if you make one wrong click on an email, right? It's an electronic mail. You make the wrong click, that's it. Your computer is completely owned by someone else. And all the data is at risk. And it could be up at night doing who knows what. That's weird. Among their advice, this is my favorite piece of advice. Be weary of emails that have misspellings, <laughs> poor grammar, or odd characters. <laughs> They're a red flag for fraud. I wrote back, I was like, I think I got one. <laughs> they gave me a one-way ticket to Oxford. The fundamental problem is this. The cap and crunch bosun's whistle. A prize in a box of cap and crunch cereal in the early 1970s. After you've given your child a bowl of cereal, why not? Have her burn off the sugar by running around the house and blowing a whistle. So it was a good prize. But it turns out it had an extra feature. If you cover one hole of the whistle and blow, it emits a tone at exactly 2,600 hertz. The tone at the time used by monopoly telephone provider AT&T to indicate an idle line. In America, pick up the phone, blow the cap and crunch whistle, and you get free long distance telephone calling. Wow. Boxes of cap and crunch cereal flying off the shelves. <laughs> they have no idea why at General Mills. Oh, new third-party app for our cereal. How unusual. <laughs> the problem was that the technology for AT&T was not meant to be a civic technology, to be controllable in any way by the people. It was just meant to carry the data. The channel of communication was supposed to be separate from the channel of control. But they had just made a mistake. They fixed it. They're AT&T. They ran the whole network. They made it so that there was no sound you could utter that would re, uh, uh, reflect uh, on the network itself. It would just carry the sound to the other side. Fine, they fixed it. The internet is still at exactly this place. The pathways that carry are tweets and instant messages and Facebook friend requests and emails are also the passages that carry executable code, whether to instruct intermediate routers or to reprogram the machines at one end or the other. And we wouldn't want it any other way. Of course you want to be able to click on something and vroom, have it running on your machine. But that's also the heart of the security problem that isn't operating system specific. My claim is that if we don't figure out how to solve this problem, we will see the end of the personal computer and the concept behind it as we have known for 30 years. And by the concept behind it, this is what I am talking about facing extinction. The idea of a programming environment in which you get to say, what code runs and doesn't run. You will voluntarily assign that decision to someone else and then forget about it. That's what we see happening in corporate, educational, cyber cafe, library environments. As more and more you can't run new code on your computer, it's just, sorry, we don't want you to have the flying toaster screensaver, because who knows what else it does. And for any given IT department administrator, that is a rational choice. But for the overall ecosystem, in my view, it's a disaster. And we see it not just taking place with the PC. We take it into a new range of internet aware, but otherwise locked down internet appliances like Sky Plus and TiVo, many Blackberries, most but not all mobile phones, the Amazon Kindle, really cool things that we like, 
but that don't allow outside code, or if they're going to allow them, allow them only on their own terms. iPod certainly is an example, and yes, the iPhone as well. Yeah. Going back to the first slide with the guys with the games. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, did they envision you know, that, that they were creating this thing that was going to ultimately become the world's infrastructure for banking and you know, uh, commerce, et cetera, because, I mean, isn't that really the problem now? That yes. It's potentially going to collapse under its own weight because of the risks that are now, you know, you could have a cyber disaster, and you described it that with YouTube, but YouTube, right. who cares, right? Right. But if all of a sudden you can't go to the ATM and get your cash, yes. now we've got a problem. That's half the problem. I completely agree with you. And that's the part I need to persuade the geeks of, because the geeks are pretty much like, is not a problem. What there are are stupid people. And either they get what they deserve and let Darwin win, or let's educate them, or let's give them play pens. If they can't be trusted behind the wheels of an 18-wheeler, put them in a smart car or a golf cart. I mean, you know, but I'm still going to drive my 18-wheeler. And I'm trying to say, no, actually, I don't want to see an environment that's like the end of Atlas Shrugged, where all the good capitalists go off into their own golden valley and mow each other's lawns, and the rest of the world sinks into the ocean, metaphorically speaking. And yes, so half the problem is to say, what we have today is not tenable. The other half of the problem is to say, most of the solutions that leap out first are iatrogenic. They are actually almost as bad or often worse than the problem itself. And let me just give you a couple quick examples of that. Picking up with the iPhone. This is version one of the iPhone. It's still gorgeous. And every icon you see was designed by Apple Computer in Cupertino, California, how they say so proudly on your packages when you get them from Apple. And Steve Jobs makes no apology for this. In the beginning of 2007, he says, of course we are going to control everything on the phone. You wouldn't want it any other way. It's going to be like a PC if we make it on the other way. And believe me, I'm Steve Jobs. I know a little something about the PC. That was 30 years ago. This is now. People turn out to be so eager to still share outside code on the phone that a significant, minor but significant, slice of them start jailbreaking their iPhones so they can run outside code. And Apple's first reaction is to threaten them with their phones being bricked if Apple uh, should try to do an update to a phone that has been jailbroken. But finally, Steve Jobs gets religion. He says, OK, you're right. We're going to have outside code on the iPhone. And we're going to have an SDK, a so-called <laughs> software development kit, not a real Newsweek cover. So um, very exciting. Going to be third-party code for the iPhone. But there's a huge asterisk attached to it. What's the asterisk? Well. If I'm Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston, I've just written VisiCalc for iPhone, and you all have iPhones, I can't give it to you. I can't sell it to you. I can't move it to your phone. Instead, I have to go up to Steve Jobs and be certified as an iPhone coder. And only then can I submit to Apple my app. And then, if they like it, it appears in the iPhone app store for people to buy. And Apple takes a cut if purchase is what they're going to do. What won't they let in the store? Well, basically anything they don't want. This is uh, another blurry Steve Jobs describing the limitations. Illegal, malicious, privacy, porn, bandwidth hog, and my favorite, unforeseen. Can't have anything unforeseen on the iPhone. What has that meant in practice since the store opened? Just a year ago, just a year ago that the iPhone app store opened. Well, here is um, uh, a, a, an application that lets you tether your iPhone to your PC so your all-you-can-eat bandwidth can be used by your PC to check email on the PC. For obvious reasons, not sitting well with AT&T, banned from the store. Here's one that's a little less clear. It lets you have movie reviews banned from the store. And uh, the account of it says, well, the developer has emailed Apple but hasn't heard anything back. <laughs> Netshare was also leaked. We're not sure. Maybe there's an unsecu undiscovered security flaw. Now, can you imagine Bill Gates in his most proprietary days, one Wednesday morning, killing Netscape? And the reports are, Netscape no longer works on any PC. Emails to Microsoft have gone unanswered, but there's speculation that there might have been a security flaw. We'll keep you posted. It turns out that when you start closed and only gently open, you get a lot more slack from the world than if you start open and try to close. 
One last example I couldn't resist. This was a small application called Freedom Time, counting down the number of days, hours, minutes, and seconds until, quote, the end of an error last fall, looking towards Inauguration Day, banned from the iPhone store. The guy that wrote it writes to Steve Jobs and says, you know, come on, what's the problem? It's all in good fun. Don't you go to jib jab, that kind of thing. And uh, Steve Jobs actually writes him back, he says, and says, uh, even though my personal leanings are democratic, I think this app will be offensive to roughly half our customers. What's the point? And you realize that we are creating, by our own consumer choices, an infrastructure that empowers certain entities to have to be persuaded, what's the point? And the minute you have to say what the point is, anything truly disruptive, it's hard to say. Can you imagine trying to justify Wikipedia to investors? No, really, it's going to work, guys. This is a great idea. They'd be like, what's the point? Of course it won't work. If Wikipedia had had to go through any form of the slightest amount of gatekeeping, it would not have existed. And in, I agree with that. In, in the Soviet Union, anything you started had to be approved of by some party official or another, or, or else you're in a heap of trouble. See, I knew that there'd be a flavor of Godwin's Law at work here that eventually Steve Jobs would be called a communist. <laughs> but yes, I agree with you that to the extent that you try to have a system that is explicitly rational like this, you end up with a system that is innately conservative, not in the political sense, but in the sense of being mistrustful and despising change. It's innately conserv conservative. And if you look at the story of, so, say, the Soviet computer science, you will see how uh, things that bloomed here yes. were killed there yes. by having to explain themselves yes. endlessly. Agreed. And my worry is that this model where you will have to explain yourself to somebody is not just the future of our phones. Because if it were just about phones, it's like, fine, it's phones. It's like, do I care that my fridge doesn't run third-party apps? No. But I say this is the future of nearly all mainstream consumer software development. That's what I mean about the death of the PC. Yes, sir? Isn't it, isn't it economic so the product? Absolutely. In other words, as opposed to Sergey's example yes. of central planning by, based on ideology. Isn't it the market and just it, it's, doing it? It's the market because Correct. What, what Apple's afraid of is one security vulnerability. Apple just wants to help. Denigrating I their, agree with denigrating that. their brand with yes. say, porn apps Correct. and things like that. So they have a concern. Yes. Right? Yeah. Actually, uh, if, if, I might, if I may interject, the thing about central planning uh, that, that, that killed everything from under it was not that it was based on ideology. Uh, they actually wanted success in technology. They were actually willing to compromise and cut the scientists a lot of slack. All fair. But, but now what he could come back with is to say, well, yes, but so long as there's Apple and Schmapple and eight other firms, then they can compete to how much central planning people want. And if central planning really doesn't work out very well, won't the wild card end up winning? Exactly. They're going to come up Android. And compete. Google Android, right. which is one reason why keeping an eye on the Android platform will be really important to my thesis and to see how self-correcting we think the market can be for this problem. Now, I have reasons to think it will not be nearly as self-correcting as you think. That the historical analog would be, no matter how many competitors you lumped in to those old networks, Prodigy, AOL, The Source, you just name it, one after the other, they were all still basically the same thing competing on weird basic axes like price or you know, one has the AP newsfeed, one has UPI. None of them was as radical as the internet because all of them faced those original constraints of needing to fit into a market framework where they had to raise and spend capital and they had to demonstrate how they'd make money. And that turns out to be a limited universe and how well we have a universe of others operating on different principles to give that entire universe of competitors itself competition, to me, is one of the central questions we have to deal with. In other words, there's always going to be an economic component. Oh, but there might be a generic box that you buy that happens to be a smaller form factor than a PC that if it's eminently reprogrammable, who knows what it's doing next? It's an iPhone today, it's a Geiger counter tomorrow. Just like it was a business decision. Just, 
Correct. I care about their brand. If, if Correct. It's, if it's the porn box. Correct. They don't care. Just like it was a business decision to sell Apple computers to begin with, that was a dot-com play but it fit into this other civic framework. And so too with the early ISPs. They were commercial ISPs that were charging you for internet access, but they didn't care so much about their brand identity and they were interchangeable. Denise. I was just gonna say that you have other historical analogs, namely two, two technologies that we don't think at all as civic technologies, radio yes. and television. Yes. I was looking up for Mark Williams, who's not here, film and television studies. This was astounding to me, the early history of television. Totally hobbyist driven. Oh, I'm on your frequency, I'll move over one, don't worry exactly. about it. So exactly. It isn't, it isn't inherent to the technology yes. or, I think, the market. Yes. We make decisions along the But way then that's a great example of with television, you get to a zone that is 67 channels and nothing on, which is the claim that there's still competition, but it's all pretty much on minor zones. Yes, sir, in the back? a long time ago that um, telephone companies open up their media to any end devices. Yes. Right? I mean, that's that's so-called so Carter phone and Hushaphone phone decisions, covered in chapter four of the book. <laughs> um, <laughs> crucial decisions when what you were dealing with was a monopoly telephone provider well, that was forced. It's, it's, yes. It's a very similar choice. It's, it's not a monopoly in the strictest sense, but it is effectively a monopoly in that there's a few enormous companies who restrict access to their networks. Yeah, I'm not sure why you wouldn't say that's a monopoly in the strictest sense. That's a monopoly in the strictest sense. It's not a secret. Oh, well, in the case of AT&T, it was. Right, but, but now, it was, sorry, when I'm talking about Oh, I see, now it's like a duopoly. Yes, and it turns out that duopolies act a lot like monopolies, except there's no corresponding board game. Okay, so Facebook platform, talk about multiple companies that may have their own points of control and generally possibly exclusive access to that set of subscribers. Um, if you're a young nerd coding today, you're probably coding for iPhone apps because it's fun, or you might be coding for the Facebook platform, which has exactly the same restrictions, maybe even tighter than Steve Jobs for the iPhone app store. Ditto for Google apps and for all sorts of things. Now, not only are there worries about that for mercenary reasons, that business models could get in the way of innovation the way that that NetShare app was blocked in the iPhone store because it didn't fit with AT&T's per minute uh, all-you-can-eat model. But you also worry, I worry, about government coming in once there are just a handful of points of control and regulating those points of control. So Amazon in the Kindle introduces this new experimental text-to-speech feature. The publishers who had previously agreed with Amazon to put their books into Kindle format have a litter of kittens. They're like, are you kidding me? We didn't give you audiobook rights. And Amazon's like, we didn't need audiobook rights. We're reading it aloud. That's not a copyright implicating activity. And the publishers are just outraged. Amazon finally says, OK, we'll cave. And what happens? My Kindle gets reprogrammed in the middle of the night so that those books that don't want to be read aloud will no longer be read aloud. Now, what did I buy? Did I buy that feature? I bought a Kindle, but not much more. And I think of this almost as more and more things are going networked in Web 2.0. Here's the most basic product I can think of. I buy a toaster. But now let's make it a Web 2.0 toaster. So I come down for breakfast one morning, and there's a sign on it that says, congratulations, you've just gotten the May update. There are four slots now in your toaster. And you're like, wow, there's four slots. Cool, great. You come back later that day, and there's a sign on it that says, sorry, there were problems with the update. We've rolled it back. We apologize for any toast that was crushed in the retrograde. OK. Next week, you come down. It's making orange juice. And at this point, you say, what? did I buy? You did not buy a toaster. You bought a long-term relationship with a breakfast-oriented service provider. <laughs> and suddenly, you realize everything in your house and in your life is becoming this way. And you're no longer so anchored. And all they want to do is help you. you. They thought you like orange juice. Maybe you do. But it still feels weird, this level of control. And it turns out that that level of control, unique to the vendor, can then start to have all sorts of regulatory implications. So I don't know if anybody has a General Motors car with the vaunted OnStar system in it. Any OnStar users here? No? What do they use in Hanover? It's all Saabs and Volvos, isn't it? Well, so communists. Um, Subarus, yeah. So OnStar system. 
Here's a little rear view mirror. It's got some OnStar buttons. There's a microphone here, speakers behind. You can press it and talk to a human and get you know, guides and directions. And in fact, if you run into trouble, you press the help button. Help, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. And what happens? This lady, this is the actual OnStar lady, will get on her headset and say, don't worry, sir, we know you are. Help us on the way. Great. The FBI gloms onto this. And they ask an OnStar-like provider to reprogram the OnStar-like system of a car containing people of interest to the FBI to simply turn the microphone on at all times, capture everything going on in the cabin of the vehicle. The company does this because they can. What else, you know, what else are they going to do? They actually implement the order, and then they challenge it, leading to one of the most wonderfully titled cases I've ever studied, the company versus the United States. <laughs> I am not making this up. The company sues and says this extend, uh, extends beyond the limits of a wiretap uh, roving bug. Uh, the district court says no, the company loses in an opinion under seal. It goes up on appeal to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit says the company wins on the thinnest of reeds. They find that because the way the FBI asked for the thing to be reprogrammed, even if the bad guys got into trouble, fell and could not get up, if they press the help button, it still only goes to the FBI, which presumably would not come and help. That was not implementing it with minimal burdens. If, on the other hand, they rework it so that the system goes to the FBI at all times when they ask for help it three ways in, the lady with the headset, no problem. That's the current state of the law in the United States of America for a roving bug in a car. And I look at that and I say, whoa. We're not just talking about cars, of course. We're talking about every single smartphone, reprogrammable at a distance to simply turn on the microphone of the phone and be able to pick up all ambient noise as you walk around. Court order turns out to not be as big a bulwark as you might think. And it turns out that for law enforcement, the biggest barrier to them is often the effort of having to undertake the surveillance. The guys in the truck that says Chico's Pizza on the side sweating and with the things over their ears. When you can just do it from your office, it turns out that drastically lowers the cost and the court order is the court order. But you know what? Maybe I'm with you. Maybe I completely credit uh, that you would never really have trouble in the US so long as you've got these court orders. And I don't give any credence to the Department of Justice Inspector General's report that found uh, something like 30,000 uh, excesses of the wiretap and national security letter authority uh, by the FBI in the span of a year. So I'm with you, but uh, we'll yes, I'm sure we will. <laughs> but just think for a moment about the international implications. I was at a conference at which the topic was mobile advertising, and one of the panelists was the head of China Mobile, largest mobile provider in China. And he said, there are so many possibilities for mobile advertising. I am really excited. He said, you know, we can tell you how many people have attended a sporting event in China just by counting the mobile phone signals. In fact, we can even tell you who left early because we just know who has what phone. And there's kind of silence in the room. And it was actually, it was Congressman Markey got up to ask a, a question. He used many more words than I'm about to use now. Uh, he said, isn't there a privacy problem with this? And the guy from China Mobile was like, no, uh, we take privacy very seriously. We only give this information to the government. <laughs> and you're like, OK. So, you see a zone in which our choices about technology, in part influenced by our negative experiences with civic technologies that have hit that first bump and not groomed a corresponding civic defense system, that pushes us into technologies much more instantly reprogrammable and reconfigurable by the vendor and in turn allows the government a degree of freedom that from one lens is entirely uncontroversial. It's a roving bug. It just happens to be easy to implement. We have the statute for this. We have the process. What's there to see? And from another lens, you realize just how easy it is to flip a switch and end up with a surveillance state of the sort that we're relying, quote unquote, only on the law to prevent happening. Now, there was a time when you couldn't just wave a wand as the lawmaker and make something so. There was actually, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the concepts of the posse, that law enforcement was not sufficiently expertized or funded 
so that if there was anything big the government needed to do, you actually had to summon able-bodied males above the age of 16 to rally around the flag and like go enforce the law. Right? You've all seen High Noon. <laughs> you know how hard it was for Gary Cooper to get people going. Well, it turns out that in the late, uh, in the mid 19th century, there was a political accommodation among elites in the United States that said that fugitive slaves were to be returned from north to south. Now, to make that happen, you needed a posse. And it turns out that when you tried to gather your posse to implement this rule, they were, like, busy. It's like, I'm really sorry I'm shampooing my cat. How about next week when you're going to break up that gambling ring? And that meant that this was a dead letter law because the public support that was needed wasn't there. This is an Aristotelian motion for law. It only moves if you keep pushing it. When you move away from civic technologies and into their counterparts that are not civic, you get Newtonian ability for just a handful of parties to make huge leaps in either surveillance or control, and there's not much you can do about it. So what should we do about it? Let me just spend a couple minutes on that, because I know we're hitting the end, and we should leave some time for just free-ranging discussion. Well, I believe we can take some of the lessons of civic defense from things like the internet and Wikipedia and apply them more broadly. They don't self-execute. Somebody actually has to step forward to do it, but they can happen. In an interesting experiment that's more evocative, I think, than it is a real demonstration, a researcher recently in New York City set up something she called tween bots. These are these little cardboard robots with a crucial smiley face printed on them and a little Mattel Electronics engine that moved them just forward at a very slow pace, and a flag on the back saying where they're trying to go. You can write the rest of this, right? People would pick up the tween bot before it would go into a ditch or hit a car and redirect it just a little bit towards its destination. Here's one tween bot placed here with a flag that said it wanted to be here in Washington Square Park. 43 people intervened as it moved around to set it on its path to get to where it's going. Now, if it turns out this is a new form of package delivery, and I just paid Tweenbot Inc. to deliver it there and waited for people to show up and do it, right? people might not want to help anymore. I don't know. On the other hand, you know, how many people use Yelp, even though it's all for Yelp.com's benefit? Yes, sir? But wouldn't it work if there were 60 robots? If there are robots everywhere. Right. This is exactly the scaling problem of the internet. It's like at some point you're like, fuck the bots, right? Yes, completely agreed. That's why I say it's more evocative than it is a literal path forward. But it does show that there is a surfeit of goodwill to be tapped that in the right moment can be very powerful. That's the lesson I take. And you're absolutely right. If there were tween bots everywhere, you'd start kicking them affirmatively out of the way. No, no doubt on that. So I'm part of two initiatives uh, that are meant to try to tweak and deal with that surfeit and see how far we can take it. One is stopbadware.org, which tries to deal with the problem of malware online. The other is the Open Net Initiative that I've already referred to that tracks internet filtering around the world. And one hope is to be able to write software that will be downloadable to anybody's machine if you want to participate in this. And the software will anonymously radiate your machine's vital signs to the rest of the herd that's participating. And with that, when I'm about to click on that hamster and run some new code, I can stop for a second and say, wait a minute. How new is this code to the herd? Is it brand new, or has it been around for years? Or how many self-described experts in the herd have chosen to run this code versus clueless people like me? And it turns out that being able to ask a couple basic questions can greatly help, depending on your level of risk aversion, your own decision about what code to run without turning over to a single gatekeeper the kind of proxy that results in the non-civic technologies that I fear for all the reasons already discussed. Now, is this system gameable? Absolutely. At the point somebody starts to game it, we've hit our first milestone of success. We are worth gaming. And then we have to figure out how to get around it. So we have alphas up of what we call Herdict, Verdicts from the Herd, an absolutely terrible name. Um, it's especially bad because our icon is a sheep. Uh, and sheep come in flocks, so it should technically be flock dict, but I can't bring it ourselves to call it that, so it's herdict. And so that's herdict PC trying to deal with, uh, for the first time, 
to steal a, for, uh, a phrase from Bill Gates, a digital nervous system for the internet. Um, but we're also deploying it to reinvigorate our ongoing research on internet filtering around the world, which was previously centrally done. We would send people or recruit people in a state to run tons of tests on what they can get to and what they can't, and then get out before they get arrested which is a dicey way of performing academic research. So we've created a site and a toolbar called Herdict Web. And with Herdict Web, you can, you can visit this if you're online right now. You can actually, when you can't get somewhere online, you can just click and make that report and say, I can't get there from here. What's going on? And the act of asking that question helps to start answering it. Because we can see from different people's reports who can get where and when, and we can start to Winnow out when China is blocking YouTube or make an inference about that, or when YouTube is voluntarily withholding certain videos from Thailand, as they are, because they insult the Thai king, or when one company doesn't let its employees get somewhere, or one ISP doesn't let its subscribers get somewhere. Now we'll actually have a neighborhood watch from that, depending on people wanting to install this because it's fun, it's playful, and maybe because it's helpful, just like SETI at home. We even, inspired by the website Am I Hot or Not, came up with Am I Blocked or Not. And here you can just go through and view one blocked page as reported by others after another and say whether you two can see it. And that way, if one ant goes up the trail, we send a couple more ants and then a couple more, and with it can start to elaborate where the blocks actually are and aren't. So in conclusion, there was a time when it was actually sensible to hitchhike. And in fact, how many people in this room have hitchhiked before? Right, complete age normalization with a little <laughs> bit of, right? There was a time. It's just obvious that you do it. Right, exactly. Now, for those of you who haven't hitchhiked, have you ever come close? The answer is no. Are you kidding? Well, one person's like, yeah, I almost did once. But most people are like, no, of course not. You will die if you hitchhike. <laughs> haven't you seen, e.g., the hitcher? But that shift was a cultural shift of trust. That's a, a totally a civic technology that ended up hitting that bump, not evolving, for obvious reasons, a civic defense system that could work. And so, boom, it goes off the table. And no amount of competition easily replaces it. You just get eight different kinds of taxi services. On the other hand, maybe hitchhiking is making a comeback. This is the Craigslist rideshare board. Yeah, well, <laughs> what with the Craigslist killer and all. Yeah, it's too bad that he didn't advertise in the newspaper, thereby being the newspaper killer, right. But of course, if they called this the Craigslist hitchhiking board, tumbleweeds. It's not hitchhiking, it's ride sharing. And for another thing, we know that killers don't plan ahead. That's what makes this safe. Well, I don't know. Then you look at something like couch surfing. Any couch surfers among us? One, have you actually couch surfed or hosted a couch surfer? No, but I'm the most obvious that you get points by actually You're getting close. I try to do this one. I want to know the same thing. Yeah. People who I want to want to get interested in Yeah. Right. So within that answer, there's a lot to unpack. We'll only just take a minute to unpack it now. What is couch surfing? The brainchild of one guy, Daniel Hoffer, college grad who decided that it was high time we create a service to pair up people who are going to a faraway place and want to sleep on a stranger's couch for free with people who live far away and would like a stranger to sleep on their couch for free. Yeah, why didn't we think of this? What a great idea. And it turns out, yes, thousands of people actually want to do this. And it starts off totally in a backwater where it's a wonderful inverse Groucho problem. The kind of people who find their way to couch surfing are the kind of people that you want to host on couch surfing. Then it gets more and more popular. At some point, Fox runs a story, the new way of staying in a hotel for free at 10. And then you get an influx of people in who don't really know the norms of couch surfing, which is like you're supposed to play the lute or do the dishes or something. It's not just like free, but it's more you know a human kind of thing. And your first instinct on hearing about this might reasonably have been how many people have died using couchsurfing.com. Right. Now, they have evolved a civic defense system. So it turns out there's all sorts of ways of rating the visit. And I know it's a little bit weird because you only rate the visit after it happens, which means that for the dying problem, it's a selection bias. 
But they actually have come up with all sorts of ways. You have to prove your cred a little bit, that you actually have to be a really conniving criminal, which means, first, most of them aren't, and second, you know what, I'll just as soon pick a pocket than deal with the hassle of trying to worm my way in so I can boost something out of someone's house. And couch surfing ends up taking off. That's the kind of civic technology that isn't just the technology itself is civic. It allows more of a civic interaction among people that is more and more lacking, especially if you ask people maybe who lived through the era of hitchhiking, and that's so crucial, I believe, to recapture. In North Korea, the radios by law must be tunable to like one of only three stations. The radios themselves. It's like the Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung Reflection Hour, the Kim Jong-il Party Hour, and Rhythm and Blues. Like, that's it. You can't turn the radio to any other frequency. It's like, yeah, if you didn't have it, we'd have to make them up. Yes. 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 And there's that hidden hotel that's the shape of a bat that's like one of the most massive buildings in the world that didn't work out. The, the, the concrete was like defective. So they were like, we shall never speak of it again. So you like ask the taxi driver, I'd like to check out that hotel. He's like, what hotel? He's like, that big hulk to the left. He's like, I don't see anything. Do you see anything? So in South Korea, they have this idea of taking solar powered regular FM radios, tying them to helium balloons, and floating them across the demilitarized zone to give the people in North Korea hope of a technology that isn't engineered to shape and control them. Now that's obviously one anchor point at the extreme of where we can go with technologies that don't have any civic dimension to them. At the other extreme is the concept of the generative computing environment, whether on your PC or out in the cloud, hooked up to a neutral internet. That not attainable in the medium term. All sorts of problems with that. Somewhere in the middle is going to lie the answer. And if we do it right, we can try to make it the best of both worlds. Many of the examples emerging right now, I believe, are the worst. Thank you. <laughs>